It was a regular day in Waco, Texas, the United States, on February 28, 1993. The Branch Davidians, a religious group led by David Koresh, were going about their day in their home base, situated in the Mount Carmel Center compound. Suddenly, law enforcers from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, ATF, arrived at their doorstep. They brought with them a search warrant for possession of illegal firearms along with an arrest warrant for David. Suddenly, a shooting began. Whoever fired first, we'll never know. But at the end of the two-hour conflict, six Branch Davidians and four ATF officers had died. This got the attention of the FBI, and that was the beginning of what would be one of the worst shootout incidents in the history of the United States. The Branch Davidians was a religious group infamous in the 1990s as the existence of their group began the conversation of cults and criminal activities in religion. Although it was only recently formed in the 1980s, its roots could be traced way back to the 1930s. Born in Reykovo, Eastern Rumelia, Victor Houtif was a young man when he started the mercantile trade. In 1907, he and his brothers emigrated to the United States because a mob had threatened his family and forced them onto a boat. Upon arriving in the U.S., Haustiff was virtually broke. However, he soon found work as a hotel manager in the state of Illinois. By 1919, he joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a Protestant Christian group distinguished by its church attendance on Saturday instead of Sunday and their emphasis is on the second coming of Jesus Christ. In 1929, Houtif, a devout Seventh-day Adventist member, wrote a book called The Shepherd's Rod, which called for the reformation of the beliefs of the SDA church. However, this was rejected by Adventist leaders. Undeterred, Houtif and his followers continued to practice and settled on a tract of land on the western outskirts of Waco, Texas, United States where they built a compound called the Mount Carmel Center. Come 1955, Houtif's death led to a shift in leadership. His wife Florence was appointed as leader. She claimed to know that by April 22, 1955, the new messianic age will occur. On the day of her prediction, hundreds gathered with her. However, nothing happened. This disappointed many followers and factions were formed afterward. One of these factions was called the Branch Davidians, and by 1987, control was given to a man named David Koresh. Shortly after being appointed as the group's leader in 1987, Vernon Howell changed his name to David Koresh. David was born from a one-night stand between his 14-year-old mother and 20-year-old carpenter father named Bobby Howell. Two years after David was born, Bobby left the family after meeting another woman. David never knew Bobby and instead grew up with a terrible stepfather. Growing up with a dysfunctional family, David's childhood was anything but pleasant. He was often an outcast and was even allegedly raped by older boys. Due to his dyslexia, he dropped out of high school. However, by the young age of 12, he knew the New Testament like the back of his palm. By 1981, David moved to Waco, Texas, and joined the Branch Davidians. It was the beginning of his ascent into leadership. By 1987, through a violent power struggle, David was now appointed as the leader of the Branch Davidians. He quickly began to claim that he was entitled to 140 wives, 60 women as his queens, and 80 as concubines. He advocated polygamy and even asserted that he could claim any woman in the compound as his. Because of his sexual activity, he fathered several dozens of children from women as young as age 12. In Texas at that time, the legal age of consent for marriage and sex was 14. Throughout the years, there were several more cases thrown at David, including testimony from the daughter of a member of the Branch Davidian, who claimed she was molested at the age of 10 by David. Also, according to an insider, David annuls all married couples once they join the cult, which gives him the freedom to claim the women. Additionally, he claimed exclusive sexual access to all the women and had regular sexual relations with young girls whose ages ranged from 11 to adulthood. 
During his reign as the Branch Davidian leader, David loved to collect guns and claimed it was for the preparation for the coming apocalypse. This would later catch the eye of the feds. On February 28, 1993, approximately 100 agents from the ATF arrived at the Mount Carmel Center compound around 9.30 a.m. They attempted to execute a search warrant for the hoarding of illegal firearms and an arrest for David Koresh. Suddenly, gunfire broke out. Nobody knows to this day who started it first, but in the ensuing struggle, four ATF agents were killed and 16 were wounded. On the other hand, six Branch Davidians were killed and an undetermined number were injured, including David. This standoff caught the attention of the FBI, and in a matter of hours they became the lead agency in resolving the situation. This was when the grueling 51-day power struggle began. On March 1st, negotiations began with David and 10 children were released. David spoke over the radio and claimed that the prophecy was being fulfilled and that this was simply the end of times unfolding. The following day, two women and six children were released. David promised that he would surrender if a taped statement of his was broadcast. The FBI agreed and the sermon was broadcast on radio and TV, but David changed his mind and did not want to give up. Negotiations began again, and the federal agents claimed that David told them he'd only give up once he got further instructions from God. Between March 4th, 5th, and 12th, David released two children and two adults from the compound. On March 18th, the federal agents strategized on how they would resolve the situation without resorting to violence. They came up with an idea. The FBI placed loudspeakers near the compound and sent out a message to the members, saying that they would be treated fairly if they come out and surrender. The next day, the FBI sent the compound legal documents, letters from David's attorneys, and other items. In a few hours, David once again claimed that he was going to surrender. On March 20th, one Davidian comes out of the compound. On the morning of March 21st, two more women exit the compound. Negotiations were becoming increasingly frustrating at this point, so the FBI started to play dirty. At night, they played very loud music, including Tibetan chants over the loudspeaker system. This angered David, and by 11.35 p.m., he was reported to have said, because of the loud music, nobody is coming out. The loudspeakers continued to play, but suddenly, a malfunction in the system occurred, and the night ends quietly. The next day, on March 22nd, David's spokesperson, Steve Schneider, expressed anger toward the loud music. In an attempt to pacify the situation, the negotiators blamed the FBI tactical agents. The crisis management team held a meeting to discuss stress escalation measures, which meant that they would attempt to put stress on David so he could be coaxed into surrendering. However, if it fails, the negotiators recommended the use of tear gas as a non-lethal alternative to clear the compound. Although the negotiators had predicted David's long stall, they believed at the time that the situation would eventually be resolved calmly and peacefully. The negotiators were terribly wrong about this. The next day, on March 23rd, one member of the group left the compound. Unfortunately, he would be the last one to leave during the 51-day standoff. The FBI's methods were questioned at this point. Assistant U.S. Attorney William Johnston of Waco wrote a letter to complain about the FBI's handling of the case, especially the moving vehicles around the compound. However, the FBI was undeterred about this as they grew increasingly frustrated over David's lack of compliance. At 10 p.m., FBI agents decided to double down on the stress escalation measures. They brought out large floodlights and used them to shine on the compound while they played over the loudspeaker system the tapes of previous negotiations and messages from those who had exited the compound. The following day on March 24th, the FBI played loud Tibetan chants and Christmas music over the loudspeaker system in the wee hours of the morning. Already irritated from the previous loud noises, Schneider refused to talk any further and completely shut down. At the press, at 10.30 a.m., the FBI doubled down on their verbal assault against David by calling him a liar and a coward. 24 days after the first shootout, which started the grueling negotiations, the FBI was slowly realizing that their stress escalation measures were not effective and David was not complying. 
By March 25th, the FBI issued an ultimatum that 10 to 20 people must leave by 4 p.m. on the day of action will be taken against them. There was no response. By 4 p.m., armored vehicles moved into the compound to remove the motorcycles and go-karts. It took another grueling 25 days of negotiations that went nowhere before David completely managed to anger the FBI. Finally, after a bunch of ultimatums that went nowhere, Attorney General Janet Reno decided to give the go signal for the FBI to raid the Mount Carmel Center compound. On April 19, 1993, armored vehicles rolled into the compound and began to punch holes through the buildings. Canisters of tear gas were thrown inside. Shortly after, a fire broke out and the entire building became engulfed in flames. The FBI was adamant about taking David by force. Within an hour, the winds on that day fanned the flames, which reduced the entire property into ash. In the aftermath, 80 Davidians were killed, including 25 children and David himself. After the event, nothing remained of the building except for concrete foundation components as the entire site had been bulldozed two weeks after the end of the siege. There was a subsequent trial with the surviving Branch Davidians involved in the assault that led to the deaths of four ATF officers. After a jury trial that lasted nearly two months, there were 12 Branch Davidians indicted for unlawful possession of firearms and aiding the murder of several officers. However, the federal government was not completely off the hook after the event. Many people believe that the actions of the ATF and the FBI were too aggressive with their methods. Some speculated that some of the tactics executed by the agency were even illegal. There was strong public opinion about the events that unfolded in the 51-day standoff, which culminated in the deaths of 80 people. People wondered which side really started to shoot or which side ignited the flames that eventually engulfed the entire compound. In the Danforth report of the Branch Davidian siege, it was alleged that the fire was deliberately caused by some of the Davidians inside the building. However, a documentary called Waco, The Rules of Engagement, claimed that the fire was deliberately set when the FBI fired an incendiary device after the building was bombarded with pyrotechnic tear gas. Testimonials from the few Branch Davidians that escaped from the fire claimed that the FBI shot and killed many Branch Davidians who attempted to flee from the fire. Autopsy records show that at least 20 Branch Davidians were shot, including five children. The remaining Branch Davidians quickly reorganized themselves and tried to spread David's work through published works. They tried to rebuild their movement. Attorney General Janet Reno, the person who approved the raid, regretted her decision to give the FBI the go signal. However, to this day, lawmakers insist that the federal agents acted reasonably. If you're still here, thank you for watching. Based on the stories alone, the Branch Davidians acted and moved like a cult. However, it can't be denied that these people acted of their own will. Unfortunately, a lot of children died in the siege. To this day, the Waco siege remains one of the deadliest shootouts in U.S. negotiations history. Now, if you enjoyed the video, please let me know by hitting the thumbs up button, commenting your thoughts below, subscribing to our channel, and hitting that notification bell for more videos like these. See you on the next one!